Good morning and a good day to you, to you all. Uh, today I have with me uh, three very interesting individuals. Uh, I think uh, you would have uh, seen them before on Mark the Facebook page. We have interviewed them before. We have Dr. Nevis Moraes, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of the of Open University Sri Lanka. And he also he is also a member of the governing council of the Marvin Institute. And we have uh, uh, Ma Mariam Riza. She's an international speaker on what you call intergenerational human capital workforce engagement. And that is a very interesting topic. And I hope uh, Mariam would uh, do us the honors by elaborating a little bit on that and how that would come into play uh, in online learning and online training. And also we have uh, Dr. Nirmal De Silva, uh, Associate Professor in Business Administration, is a strategic consultant and a board director and a mentor. And uh, Nirmal also happens to be a consultant on Marv Institute. So good morning to you all. Uh, good afternoon to Miriam, uh, Mariam, who is in Australia, connecting uh, with us from Australia. And uh, good day to you. And I would like to first, uh, you know, um, guide a question to Dr. Moraes, uh, who's from the Open University. You see, Dr. Um, online uh, teaching and education is nothing new uh, to the Open University. Actually, online education has been there for the last 10 years, right? Uh, and also, there are some accusations that are floating around. I see on, on social media that online um, education is going to widen the gap. Uh, it's going to uh, kind of widen or increase inequality. And uh, that's an accusation um, that has been levied. Uh, from your experience, uh, especially during COVID-19, uh, I would like you to kind of touch on that uh, myth, as you, as you would call it now, and also speak about what your experience has been with uh, Open University, because you have several programs that you are conducting, and all of them are distance programs. Well, uh, thank you for that question, Amar. Now, to start with, actually, uh, the COVID-19, uh, the context, has actually uh, opened up a lot of discussion on uh, technology-assisted learning all over the world, not only in Sri Lanka. Uh, so people and policymakers have increasingly realized the, the great potential in incorporating technologies in learning, say particularly countries like ours that has been um, uh, more uh, into conventional learning methods. Uh, although online education has been practiced by not only open university, even other conventional universities for quite some time. But the potential of that has not been really thought about in detail until the COVID-19 situation, you know, uh, has arisen. So therefore, there is, that is a positive side of that. The great potential of that has now been explored in detail, right? But on the other hand, uh, it leads to a lot of uh, policy uh, issues, whether uh, whether we are actually ready, whether it is a, a proper transformation that is taking place, or whether we are in a haste to uh, take advantage of technologies in the apps, in the at the expense of uh, quality and also the social consequences. So there are uh, different questions that are being discussed by policymakers and practitioners. So as for the Open University, it has been in in this. Uh, uh, mode of education that is a blended learning. Blended learning has been promoted by Open University for quite some time. Uh, so it's not really a virtual learning. Uh, people should differentiate between a virtual learning and the distance learning. Of course, virtual is part of distance learning, but distance learning is all about uh, learning from distance using multi-mode uh, methods of learning, not just you go out of uh, physical, you know, touch. So therefore, uh, Open University has been doing this. Of course, it has been slow in introducing, you know, more and more technologies because of the reality 
faced by the uh, faced by the system as well as the learners. So we have been quite uh, doing this, but it was quite slow, as I would admit. Uh, but now uh, there is a you know increased interest in you know taking this forward in a great deal uh, and getting the support of uh, people and the policymakers. So that is actually the positive side of that. Of course, we can discuss the other viewpoints uh, later. Yeah, I mean, you said that um, universities have not really uh, kind of capitalized on the potential. You see, uh, as we had previous discussions, even when Marga and Open University was looking at costing uh, for the master's program. You see, if we have online, um, I believe we could reduce a lot of costs, uh, especially costs will be reduced because of transport is uh, eliminated, call charges are eliminated. But still, it appears that uh, uh, we cannot get out of that mindset, uh, uh, you know, old traditional mindset where everybody has to be in one place um, and, you know, uh, things have to be done the way it has been done. Uh, can I get a kind of a, uh, opinion from a uh, view from Dr. Nirmal on this? Uh, he's talking of breaking away from um, this mindset uh, that prevents us to embrace uh, new technology. Uh, will that come into play in a post-COVID situation? So, uh, first and foremost, I want everybody, um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, to this wonderful panel. Uh, it's blessed with both beauty and brains, uh, and it's not often that you get an opportunity to speak in a panel like this. Uh, so, Amma, I think we need to understand, first and foremost, your last statement on post-COVID-19. In my humble opinion, I think first to get rid of COVID, it might take even two years until we get a proper vaccine. So I think we are still in a COVID period moving forward. It will be a well. COVID. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think mindset matters a lot because when we look at education in a very holistic manner, we are looking at a multitude of aspects from early education, primary, uh, secondary, tertiary, etc., and continuous professional development related education. And in all of these, uh, we need to understand that education industry has been getting disrupted and technology has been one of the key players uh, in that. We've been continuously moving away from a qualification-driven educational approach to a more skills development education approach. At least that's what's been demanded by potential employers, companies like Google and so forth do not even look at qualifications anymore. They are looking at skills. And we've seen top-notch universities across the world, top-ranked universities, also struggling to keep up with the change from the traditional brick and mortar education system. Of course, just like most of the things, the early adopters towards technology has seen a significant first move advantage uh, in terms of adapting technology. Now, coming back to more precisely on your question on mindset, I think it's to do with the individuals as well and every stakeholder involved in the educational uh, industry, from policymaker right down to the parent and the student. Everybody has to play a very pivotal and important role. And I, I want to start up with a bit of a touchy subject from a parental point of view. I think we have a very competitive oriented education system in Sri Lanka and rather than seeing your son or daughter excelling to be the best version themselves we have a comparison type of a thought process uh, is this student better than the next door neighbor uh, and how would that impact my social circle uh, and so forth and there is a lot of money that uh, average Sri Lankan household invests in education whether it's directly or indirectly so in that scheme of things, uh, with technology disruption, it allows a lot of opportunities for everybody within this game. Now, we'll discuss a little bit more in detail uh, in the next few rounds on what are the opportunities available as a result of technology. However, I still believe that from Sri Lankan point of view, 
uh, I think it might also be an island uh, mentality to a certain degree. We want to hold forward in terms of the status quo. We don't want too many changes happening. And to a certain degree, we are hell-bent in our thinking that our education system is quite strong uh, and we can produce holistic uh, outcomes uh, in comparison to the competitive world which in my humble opinion, I think we are doing a decent job, but I don't think we are on par with some of our Asian countries even, who's taken a leap forward in terms of looking at critical skills, problem solving skills, uh, most of those skills that the World Economic Forum has been talking about from 2015 onwards. Mm -hmm. The second part of the question very briefly is that we are challenged as a world in terms of achieving our sustainable development goals by 2030. And if you really look at it, the education system should be grooming people in terms of achieving that. We, we are looking at a value-based approach of student outcomes. Of course, we can have brilliant people topping badges and getting a qualification. Uh, it's like a recent uh, discussion we had with a set of peers. We have so many MBAs in Sri Lanka. But do they really understand what an MBA qualification is all about? Are they actually adding value? Or is this just a good paper qualification and a line that you can put in your CV or the business card? So I think if we have to relook at the overall future of education in Sri Lanka, how we need to embrace technology and how we need to be relevant, I think that's the key word, relevant with world standards, then definitely we need to have a mindset. And it's not a single entity's response we need a multi-stakeholder appreciation of this and the willingness to change i will discuss a little bit further Ma, in the next yeah. few rounds no, i think mariam has been waiting very patiently <laughs> all this while yeah. we'll we'll shift from education to training uh, if you all don't mind i'll get back to you uh, nirmal and uh, Dr., uh, dr nirmal and dr Maras, uh, again on education because you know still talking about the mindset we have that uh, the whole cultural aspect of wanting to go to you know these halls of education as we call it you know have that experience in moving into a uh, university the brick and mortar model uh, that's part of the whole kind of ethos or experience of interacting with other students and all that so the virtual um, learning experience does not touch that uh, does not cater to that particular emotional need. I'll get, I'll get back to that. But I, I'm very interested to hear from uh, Maria uh, uh, about the work she has done on this area of intergenerational human development uh, uh, engagement, uh, which comes into play when organization, when training programs are conducted uh, in organizations and we have different uh, people from different generations blending into uh, a particular culture and if they if organizations are you know engaging in cultural change um, there are lots of challenges and and if that training process is done um, through say blended means or online means what are the challenges that they would face uh, i would like to get your input and your experience on that Maria. Thank you, Amar, for that. And thanks, uh, Nirmal and Dr. Marais. Always interested to hear your opinion on uh, the blended approach to learning and development. And I think that what I do is I wear two hats in Australia. Number one, I do uh, strategy consulting for human capital engagement. And that means intergenerational and what um, Amar just mentioned. It's around how different generations approach workforce engagement, but also that training and development piece. And I also lecture at the Victoria University here. And because of COVID and also before COVID, we were part of the Victoria online program where we were already moving a lot of our content online to teach to postgraduate and undergraduate students. Now to answer your question, Amai, in terms of what are the differences with the generations and what we're seeing in the corporate learning and development space is I think the, 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 the method in which generations consume content is different. So in terms of our value sets, in terms of what we want for our lives, human psychology doesn't change. We still want food, we still want a house above our head, and we still want good family. But how we approach these things are different. 
to give you an example, previously how we used to go to school was we go and sit in front of a teacher for nine hours or for six hours, we sit and you know, we study, and then it transitioned to tuition programs where in addition to the, the secondary education, we also had a really strong tuition program. And then you saw perhaps even from a cultural point of view, South Asia or Southeast Asia is a very academic oriented system where it's about study, 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 and there is very little emphasis on extracurricular activity. But when you, when you look at the younger generation now, the method in which they learn is more, and, and this is perhaps even Professor Morais can uh, touch on this as well, where we've moved from a behavioral level of education to a more constructivist level of education. And what that means is you're actually empowering the learner to create their knowledge around them. So you as, as, a, as a learner, and this sits in a professional corporate level and also from an academic system, where as, as an educator, your role using scaffolding, scaffolding is the art of education, to design a pedagogy or the way you deliver your content to induce the learner to learn. What I'm trying to say is previously or what you would see in the previous generation was it was a very demand push level of education where you said okay this is what i'm going to teach you in a corporate setting or in an academic setting this is the syllabus push it this is what you're going to learn i'm going to give you your assessments and the assessments are very three hours right 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 that is the way the assessment was now we're moving towards a constructivist learning where the learner sort of understands, okay, based on what Nirmal just mentioned about the critical things, about reskilling for job ready programs, they now know what they need to learn, problem solving, um, sustainability, uh, resilience. And they then go to the corporate and say, this is the gap in your training versus what I require. And this is the learning that I provide. And the way they learn is different. The tools they use are different. To give you an example, we've all heard of the ELMS, right? The Electronic Learning Management System. So you go on the computer, you type in, and then you learn. The younger generation, or even, even the current generation today, are looking at cloud-based mobile learning. So we're moving away from even computers, and now we're saying, you know what? I want to learn on my phone because while I'm in the bus or while I'm having a coffee, I want to learn. And the interface is a cloud-based interface. So it's not sitting in some standalone device where you have to go into office for a training and development but it is based on cloud, so even your learners and your educators can interact. And I, I'll be really happy to talk much more, even with Marais, around, uh, around the constructivist learning method, methodology as well. But just in terms of the, the technique as well, it's moving online and also using a lot of social media and social interaction because the piece around uh, community, community is critical as we progress into the blended and online learning because isolation is the biggest component that we'll be facing in the future. Yep. So that's yeah, yeah. And I think what you said uh, just now uh, fits in perfectly with uh, what I heard from a principal of international school, and she was she she is now using uh, online learning uh, teaching. But the difference is uh, they are not just teaching; they are just using the tool to help the students to learn by themselves. You know, it is a, like a it's like an added assistance. She was saying, Amar, you know, this, most of the people in Sri Lanka, uh, and she was not kind of being critical, but she was just being, she gave some insights, right? Uh, just converting, I think, Nirmal, you also mentioned this, because you as a parent, you have children now, you know, you have to, uh, during the lockdown, they were going through uh, their lessons online. Uh, you know, teachers were just converting the textbook into a kind of a WhatsApp message or whatever and just delivering. Whereas these teachers, this group of teachers were, were having conversations with the students, they were interacting with the students, you know, taking some text, asking the students to explain what the text is all about, uh, giving them assignments and uh, getting them to do research uh, so that they go online and check on things and, and then get back uh, and uh, you know, asking the students to make PowerPoint presentations and stuff like that. So I think this whole thing you know, of methodology, pedagogy, you know, all that uh, is very critical. Uh, if we, I mean, if we, uh, we need to catch hold of that uh, in terms of delivery. Um, I'm going to go to another um, area that I'm very interested in. Uh, it's all about engagement you know 
um, I think uh, some of the younger students, or say young children, particularly, their attention spans are very short. And you know, how do we keep them engaged? Uh, I'm going to throw a question uh, to Dr. Nirmal here because he and I was involved in doing an online training uh, to the program staff and the operational staff and HR staff of UNDP and Nirmal did an excellent program on negotiation skills, uh, enhancing negotiation skills. Uh, I'm going to ask him to speak a little bit about his experience. What are the you know, uh, shortcomings or what are the challenges that he faced? And also, I want to ask Dr. Marais about this, um, the Moody program we have on Open University. Uh, we upload um, uh, the assignments, we upload the, um, uh, what do you call, all the lessons and all that. But we find that students are not um, kind of, it's the other way around. Students are not engaging with, um, with, the, with the material that is. So I'm trying to see what kind of, um, as a group or as margins to how do we ensure, how do we, what are the challenges and how do we kind of uh, have greater engagement? Uh, what can we learn from other examples to increase engagement when it comes to online learning? Um, right, it's a, it's a very, very good uh, point about that you have raised, how to, how to get the participation of students uh, in in modern ways of teaching and assessment you know that's, that's a huge challenge uh, so we have been trying to do this so there has been a lot of training gone into uh, increase the capacity of the teachers in the university system to switch to constructivist mode of uh, teaching and assessment uh, say for the past maybe 10 years we have been you know, uh, trained in uh, in incorporating or changing this approach from you know conventional learning to more co-creating activities, things like that. But however, uh, the problem that we face in getting the participation of the student is actually coming from the larger environment, because although certain universities have been focusing on this you know creative ways of doing things at a larger level public investment has not gone into increasing the capacity of the, the larger stakeholders, like the school system is much the same as we uh, used to learn, you know, 20 years ago, uh, say content delivery has become the, you know, main mode of uh, uh, learning here. And then the teacher population uh, have not been trained in modern ways of uh, delivering content or making assessment. And also the infrastructure needed for this, like the technological uh, investment in technologies, maybe getting the private sector participation into that. So public investment in increasing the infrastructure, both physical as well as human uh, skills, have not uh, been uh, given much attention within you know, the, the budgetary processes. So therefore, however much you like to push this, I mean, change the method of learning, uh, the larger culture of learning in this country remains the same. Of course, certain private sector people have actually taken the lead in incorporating uh, more and more technologies into learning, but it is not largely happening. So in order for a transformation, I would argue that more public investment should go into the larger systems to enable this process you know to go move, uh, move forward so until such things happen i mean the student population that we get are just you know from the schools uh, who have been used to spoon feeding and uh, various other conventional uh, learning practices so that's that's the big challenge so that's probably that's one of the reasons why the the movement towards technology assisted learning or critical learning is slow in sri lanka i would say right so Simultaneously, there, there has to be, you know, attempts at all levels to, uh, towards this, uh, you know, process of transformation, I would say. Dr. Nirmal, uh, can, can you uh, yeah. touch a little bit about your experience, recent experience, uh, you and I were involved in? 
yeah, it's an interesting area, no doubt. I think first and foremost, when you look at the area of engagement, uh, in my opinion, especially when it comes to online or technology assisted delivery uh, platforms, I think setting the expectations uh, right and the objectives is very critical because you can't compare a face to face delivered lecture, a program, or even a, a training in the same way if it's done online. And so the expectations of the participants also needs to be very clear on their on what they're getting into. Secondly, other than the obvious challenges of technology related, your broadband speeds, etc. Uh, the positive side of that is in an online delivered module, you can always record it and view it a number of times, which in a typical lecture or a typical program, you might not be able to do that. And this whole notion, Aman, this is an interesting point that unfortunately most of the people in the industry is not talking about the difference between surface learning and deep learning. Mm -hmm. And what online learning needs to do is as much as possible to minimize the gap between the two. It can't be a hundred percent fix, but you need to minimize it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the traditional, uh, and let's be brutally honest, most of the tuition masters who were basically running tuition centers like broiler homes uh, are the most impacted from this COVID-19 scenario and the online version. Because suddenly the jokes that they used to do in a class, the attraction that they had of bringing students and their whole success factor of saying that they produce so many 4A students so many 9A uh, students cannot be posted anymore, right? Because now people can compare others who can deliver better, probably at a fraction of a cost, uh, and it's, it's pretty much disrupted, right? You have more opportunities now. So the monopoly game has been broken as a result of technology. Now, that opens challenges to all of us, Amar. Right, we can't look at the same way. We might have had a good set of corporate clients that we've been working very closely with, but now it's it's suddenly become an increasing minefield where everybody wants to get into training. And if you do trainings the same way you used to do, you are going to be a lost ball in a golf league. And when it comes to engagement, I think it's about creating that fun learning experience. I don't see any difference between going on a weekend holiday to a hotel versus a learning. It's all about the experience end of the day. Uh, that's what matters the most. It's not the qualification, it's not the hotel that you went to, but it's the overall experience. And that's what's creating challenges to people who has a traditional mindset. Uh, now, the other side of it very quickly is that if you look at secondary school students, like my kids, for example, I believe even my wife, is learning at the moment because she's also going through all the modules. She has to be seated with all the kids, go through, listen. And if you are the teacher on the other side, you're under tremendous pressure because in case you do a mistake, you suddenly have parents now looking at you uh, and listening to every word that you say, which means that you need to change the overall process as well and be prepared. I must say, Sri Lankan education sector has been rather vulnerable in that area. More often than not, we have lecturers, tutors, teachers, and even, even skilled trainers coming into a program without being properly prepared. Mm. Right? They're trying to recycle some content which they had using the same examples over and over again. Uh, even if they do 100 uh, programs, you'll get the same example. Those methods are going to get exposed. So I think engagement starts from setting the expectations right, right up to the experience level. So it's a, it's a large quantum and the deep learning versus surface learning component is extremely critical to understand. Uh, Nirma, just to um, touch on what you said. Now, if you, if you use the word education market, permit me if I use the word, and you look at the supply side of things and you said, uh, this whole online platform is going to open up a lot of competition. Uh, but do you think uh, um, people who are sort of always want to be one step ahead of this, 
uh, uh, their way to step up their game would be to uh, partner and collaborate. Uh, and I think uh, from a social sociological point of view, uh, one thing society should learn or may have learned from COVID-19 is, okay, uh, we are in, in this together and unless we cooperate, unless we partner, unless we collaborate, uh, we can't come out uh, uh, as, uh, you know, as victors. So do you think, uh, you know, look at all these uh, different players, um, there will be partnerships, collaborations, or do you think that model uh, is a way to go? Or, I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking for your kind of, your marketing uh, kind of uh, knowledge to answer this question. Uh, I think, Amma, yes, it's not only in the education industry. Uh, I believe that uh, partnerships and collaboration and joint ventures, uh, strategic tie-ups, has to be a pivotal element in any industry's business model. Uh, I think uh, there is no choice there. The reason is it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel, especially when you have expertise available across the world. What technology has done is made the world much more smaller and COVID-19 is a great exemplification of that. So when it comes to education providers, in, instead of looking at purely from a content point of view or an outcome, which is a qualification point of view, uh, rather than just looking at it from a narrow definition, I think now you need to look at it from a definition of the whole holistic learning experience. And I'll give you a quick example. What COVID-19 has done is pushed people more towards continuous professional development. Yes. They've seen the value of uh, using online programs, whether it's FutureLearn, Coursera, the millions of online platforms available to enhance their knowledge. Now, you get two sets of people. One set of people is not going through all the outcomes, just going into the last module where you need to do the quiz, complete that quiz and get the certificate and say that, okay, I've completed a program. And that comes back to the mindset because there's no difference in the learning. You've not gone through all the modules. You don't understand what's been talked about there. You've just done it for the sake of saying that you spent time on getting a qualification. So that's where the, the mindset comes into picture. Now, just imagine if each and every university in Sri Lanka, each and every education service provider ties up with a recognized platform and can co-create content, which are of global recognition, of global validity, and using Sri Lankan case studies, for example, homegrown case studies. I have put in a name here, for example, for illustration purposes only, a company like Sparsilon, of how they in traditional Ayurveda, made it sexy and have created a brilliant franchise model which has now operations in more than 70 countries. Now that itself is a case study uh, and how we can take that to the global market is only possible through collaboration and partnerships. I think it's an important element in any organization's business model. Uh, I'm going to now focus on Mariam once again. Uh, Mariam, uh, you know, in education and training measurement is a very critical area. At the end of the day, to see whether a student has got it, or end of the day, to see when an organization uh, is really benefiting from a training program, there is a uh, cultural change, organization change, there is uh, actual productivity as a result of training, and there is kind of uh, economic benefit coming out of uh, training. So. Can you enlighten us a little bit about area of measurement, Prabhu? Uh, how you see as we go on, as we say, in a, in a COVID situation? Okay. Let's not talk about post COVID, as Dr. Nivar said. We are, we are in it for some time, whether we like it or not. In this whole COVID situation where there is social distancing and all that, and even training of organizations will have to be done part online, part, you know. And how do we actually measure the effectiveness of that training? Or uh, I think I'm, I'm going to echo the sentiment of Nirmal around 
when you look at measurement, you also need to fundamentally go back to the drawing board in terms of understanding the metrics that we measure people based on. Right now, we're measuring them based on, in South Asia, we measure them based on how many A's you got or how much academic performance we did. And Professor Marais probably knows this as well. We're going back to Gartner's multiple intelligences where things are not just numerical or analytical intelligences. We're talking about music, we're talking about spatial, we're talking about interpersonal or intrapersonal skills like emotional intelligence. So we need to A, go back down to the drawing board and reevaluate what we're actually measuring, what are our KPIs, what are our learning outcomes ultimately. And we're not talking about the pedagogy or the syllabus. We're talking about the syllabus is just a guide to understand what are you trying to effectively teach that year 12 student or that uh, middle manager who's in corporate who is going to embark on a leadership course. What's the essence, the conceptual understanding that you want them to leave with? Once you have the gist of what you want to leave them with, then you design your KPIs or your learning outcomes accordingly. Now, how do you measure it? That's always a hard thing. So you can either measure it through analytical measures where you say, okay, this is, you've performed these curriculums or these metrics and so therefore we award you a performance-based assessment. Also in terms of, again, you go back to the gist. How do you qualitatively analyze with somebody has studied something? It comes down to how they approach work, how they, how, they, how they enjoyed the course as well, or how they interacted with their people, and what are the learning outcomes they achieved. So again, I go back to the whole, uh, go back to the whole demand pool or constructivist way of learning, where you also ask them whether they feel like they have accumulated knowledge in terms of where they were before and where are they now, and what have they accumulated over the period of time. So one thing that we, a lot of us are quite, pop, quite big fans about is gamification. So gamification is game methodology, applying game psychology to learning or even human capital. And that's why I'm a big fan because we apply it to also employee engagement. But in a learning setting, gamification applies really well because the metrics of game components to induce people to study are really, really amazing. So for example, even with nine A's, six A's, all of that, why are we doing that? If you think about it, why is somebody who gets six A's better than somebody who gets three A's? That's what you call a leaderboard. You're, quit you're effectively creating a benchmark for people to say, okay, the person who got six A's is better than the person who got three A's. That's game mechanics, but we're using it wrong. We're using the metrics is wrong. What we should be doing is instilling collaborative tools within engagement. So you set up a game or even the way you structure your learning could be designed as a game. And you say the metrics should be about collaboration, not competitiveness healthy competitiveness, where you said the metrics is not how many A's you got, but how well you collaborated with somebody to come up with the learning outcome. Going back to your question, Amma, around measurement, metrics are important, your KPIs and how you design the playground to induce that learning is what you should be measuring, not necessarily the outcome itself. But again, it depends. If you're teaching for something very technical, like a coding skill or machine learning, then it's very technical. It's how much how many times you are able to rotate something, how many times you created something. So if it's a very, when you look at learning, it's based on three things, right? Cognitive, um, psychomot uh, psychomotors, so that's your physical, how much can you create? And then lastly, your effective. So how much have you developed your sense of self? And if you measure your KPIs based on those three components, cognitive, effective, and psychomotor, you'll be able to get an understanding of how to then measure your learning outcomes as well. Are there any examples in Australia where you could talk about where um, uh, companies or institutions have come up with certain simulations? You know, to see, you have a kind of simulation, kind of uh, gaming thing to see where the person is at at a particular time. And then after training, maybe six months later, you go through the same simulation to see uh, where the person is, whether there is some sort of improvement. Uh, Nirmal, I, I, also, do you, have you heard of anything or maybe there, there is anything in this part of the region of the world where this has been practiced or uh, Marian, you have any examples uh, where actually you, you kind of test the people to see what they have gained out of training? Mm -hmm. Because I, the reason why I'm asking is I think people um, uh, were talking I think the other day, Nirmal and I, about how organizations have just, you know, reduced their training budgets uh, because of the COVID situation. Uh, obviously, they don't kind of, maybe they're not too convinced about um, mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, their old mindset is different. But if there is, there are 
proper scientific measurements, uh, uh, which could be kind of marketed along with the train, uh, people will be more, we will have a positive more view about train. So, mm -hmm. uh, is there any example? I think, to I think in, in, in that sense, um, Amma, I think in terms of qualitative assessment, we still lag a bit in terms of measuring it, just because it's harder to measure qualitative uh, yeah. methodology. Yeah. But in terms of the quantitative, yes, it's about achievements. It's about whether you, it's still very to quote Nirmal, it's still very how many marks you got or how much have you read or how much have you engaged using it. So I think it's about, I think we measure it through social psychology. So we look at the social interactions between people and see how much they've ranked against each other. And that's possibly the approach that we take. I'm also interested to know what uh, Dr. Marais implements within the Open University as well after hearing what Nirmal has to say. Yeah, uh, I, th I think it's a fantastic point, Amma, with what you raised. Uh, so I've seen organizations now across the region in most of the engagements that we do are looking at the behavioral aspect because irrespective of the discipline that you qualify from or you pursue, you still need to deal with humans. Uh, and in the advent of technology like AI and so forth, working with the humans is going to be the critical success factor. So we've seen uh, organizations looking at concepts like Psych 101 as a, as a total approach of measuring outcomes of students who, who graduate. So they can be the best, they might have subject knowledge, but if the psychological element is not there, and if they have challenges of working with people, then there is a big issue. One of the areas that people don't talk about, and an area that I'm quite passionate is the area of startups. And especially when it comes to technology related startups, uh, they got wonderful uh, ideas on technology. They probably understood the gap in the market. But more often than not, one of the biggest reasons for startup failure is that inability to manage the, the human element. Uh, usually, co founders have a lot of issues after a period of time. Uh, they have different expectations of people coming to work for them. And that, that is becoming a bit of a problem. So if you look at most of the startups uh, and the mentoring uh, that they require, it is more towards the human element of it, how to deal with situations, etc. So we, we do see that uh, happening from an overall perspective. Another area that I want to quickly touch, I think, uh, from a Sri Lankan university point of view as well, is critical. How many universities in the world are now already ready with content to take case studies of COVID-19 lockdown scenario on how many companies failed, how many companies succeeded, and use those case studies as soon as universities start back again uh, to exemplify that to the students. So otherwise, we've actually not learned anything out of this entire outcome, right? Uh, so if it doesn't come through the educational traditional process, how are people going to understand and institutionalize it within themselves? So that's, I, I want to open the platform for that discussion, yeah. because if we are not ready for that now, we will never be ready. Yes. Dr. Moraes, anything? Well, uh, touching on all these points, I mean, uh, Mariam was talking about the measurements. Uh, my experience, I would like to uh, speak about how, uh, how I have, uh, you know, learned certain things in my own, uh, you know, teaching career. So after the introduction of this outcome-based learning, uh, where we, you know, we design courses in terms of certain outcomes. So the content is actually decided by the outcomes. So uh, Open University, of course, we have uh, learned this how to, we, had, we have been getting training on, you know, how to actually uh, set outcomes and then how to measure those outcomes. So we have not only relied on the conventional ways of measuring these outcomes by written examination and you know classroom engagement. So we have introduced different uh, methods of learning and assessment such as uh, uh, learning portfolios, uh, maintaining diaries, uh, internships and uh, reports out of internships. So this is like both a mixture of, you know, both uh, theoretical as well as practical ways of assessing the learning outcomes of the students. So uh, I don't know, uh, 
the both are qualitative and quantitative both measures should be there in measuring any outcome because it's not just you know achieving certain quantitative indicators you now we also have uh, overall quality of and the attributes of our graduates is also very important you know, what the industry is uh, looking you know uh, in them and oh how do we want them also to be as you know uh, global citizens or uh, responsible people socially responsible there are broader uh outcomes are also you know uh included in this whole uh, process of training so it's not just only uh job skills uh, or certain you know employment related skills that is needed in a university level of course we look at uh, broader levels you know it's like the whole uh, personality how what we are trying to develop how we want a person to be when they move out into the society or in the world of work so we we do have not only we uh, allow them to create knowledge within an open learning context you know there's a lot of space for them to create their own knowledge in this open learning compared to a conventional learning uh, but on the other hand as teachers and also policy makers we also want certain aspects of our graduates to to have and to develop uh, in this process so it's it's both ways as you say it's partnership definitely right mm -hmm. so therefore i mean we are trying to include uh, this uh, the holistic aspects into learning and also provide a learning experience to them uh, so i think in our tracer studies we have realized that our graduates actually have enjoyed certain methods that we use and the certain space that we have created in this open learning they have actually appreciated that because one of the important feedback that i have got from our students is that uh, uh, of course they are all coming from a conventional learning environment but and they struggled to fit into a sort of a modern open learning environment where we you know uh, incorporate different uh, learning and teaching methods there's a lot of independent self learning is involved here mm -hmm. so they struggle but at the end of the day you know the one of the key outcome one of the key realization that they have reported is that now they have learned to learn independently you know yes. so that's the greatest thing that we can hear from them uh, is that they don't talk about actually the content that they learn but actually they have what they tell us is they have learned how to learn so i mean we as teachers should create an environment where they can actually learn by themselves so it's a maybe a grand philosophy but actually we should try to put that into practice in whatever learning environment that we create so yeah, if I may add something, Amma, I want to bring this comment to both Mariam and uh, Dr. Morais as well to see two areas that I am uh, at a personal level researching on is if you look at teachers in the secondary school um, system in Sri Lanka on what their KPIs are and how we are measuring those KPIs, uh, which is very, very important to understand from a future oriented perspective. Secondly, the concept of net promoter scores from a student outcome perspective, how many of the students are willing to promote the institution, the program and so forth, that they feel that it has enhanced and enriched their lives. Now, these are two very challenging areas which policymakers have actually not even uh, probably thought about in detail. But I think if we want to really be a hub in South Asia, because again, uh, reluctantly when I need to say education is a commodity now, there is a huge commercial aspect into it, uh, and if people think exactly, otherwise, exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't think we can get away from that fact. Yes, so sadly, I think uh, one of the reasons why, uh, to, to the comment of Dr. Morais, of public funding not coming into the education system, is also because we are not looking at this from a business point of view, uh, in terms of how we can enrich the outcomes and why taxpayers' money need to go into education and how it's going to impact the lives of overall society. Uh, so this KPI-based scenario of teacher training and all of that train the trainer type of training programs uh, are really not looked into from a Sri Lankan perspective. And as a result, the teacher who taught us we were in school is, uh, of course, uh, I don't think there's a fundamentally anything different between the modern day uh, the student in terms of if you look at my, my profile as a student. Uh, however, what I was trying to say was we were not typically on books per se, Amma, right? Uh, we were able to go out 
uh, of our house and play around in the neighborhood. We learn how to climb trees uh, when we were in school. But unfortunately, my kids do not have that opportunity. They'll have to climb up an apartment if they want to find a tree, right? And that's not going to happen. So I think these are areas that we need to look into. And I would love to hear the views of Mariam and Dr. Moraes on these two areas because we can't leave aside that important element if we are looking at the future of learning. Yeah, the whole socialization process is very necessary because we're not looking at IQ only, we are looking at EQ, we are looking at you know other uh, components, what makes a person. Uh, I think we have... Right? Yes. Is it right if I have a go at the question and then I'll be interested to know your thoughts, Professor? You go ahead. Uh, so, Anirma, interesting that you touched on that. So, two facets of that, which is really interesting, around the KPIs of teachers. I think if you look at the, 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 the different levels of education, you understand where the KPIs apply. So if, if the assessment is an international standardized based assessment, then you have KPIs in your teachers. To give you an example, in private education, if it's an international qualification like ACCA or CIMA or the Chartered Institute of Marketers like you did, because the exams are assessed internationally, the teachers are based on a metric of whether they pass, whether they teach because there's a standardization. But when the teacher set their own assessments, then that's when the KPIs get a bit fudgy or foggy because then it's a self-review threat. They're effectively assessing themselves. So I think there is, when you look at the standards as well, whenever you set your own papers, and we have that here, when we sometimes set our own papers, the standard drops because you are assessing your own work. But if it's an international standardized testing, or even like the grade five scholarship or the grade 12 scholarship in Sri Lanka, the standardization, the, the, the standard of quality of teachers are higher. But that is the conversation that we need to have with leadership, where in those cases, then we set uh, we have that conversation around KPIs. Normally, it's once you onboard a teacher, that's it. They have every authority within their classroom to do things, which is the cultural mindset that you are then um, obviously lobbying for. The second point I want to touch on is this concept around education is commercial, yes. And this is why I want to ask uh, Dr. Morais's opinion. But what we saw with Australia, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous balance. See, I am a, I'm, I'm a corporate, I'm a capitalist by nature. So I am 100% for corporatizing and commercializing models. But when you come to education, the moment it's a, it's a balance. So number one, you need public funding and you need also private funding and the commercial aspect. Why? Because if you move towards too much of commercialization, things like research, medical research uh, degrees, things that don't uh, are not revenue generating degrees will start beginning to stop. So for example, in Australia, because we moved towards a more commercial model because government stopped funding universities or reduced funding, we started moving towards um, different international geographies like India or Sri Lanka. We placed more emphasis on that and we started doing degrees for the sake of doing degrees that were A, not gonna get kids employed, we were commercially profitable and C, we backed away from research type academic studies. And, and Dr. Marais would know that's a slippery slope for academics because that's why we don't, have, we don't have cures for COVID. We don't have cures for pandemics because education has moved to commercial. So it's about that balance between public funding and also private funding and private commercialization of students as well. Uh, Interesting in point, know, yes, yeah. <laughs> I think that is, that is uh, what... Um, educators here and also some other uh, people who are in this public discourse about privatization of universities, that's what they are bringing out. But having said that, um, commercial, commercialization is, is inevitable it's, it's because you are looking at sustainability. How can you sustain um, a university? So we need to find that fine balance for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would tend to agree yeah. that uh, we, it's a, a difficult path. Uh, it's a very political kind of question, uh, <laughs> which we will uh, avoid in today's discussion. Uh, also, and I think we need to have a separate discussion about the curriculum, uh, something that will, uh, will engage um, other panelists as well. I'll organize it as, and, uh, at your convenience. We have a, we'll get a group of people from uh, uh, Institute of Education from the you know, uh, Ministry of Higher Education, see how we could organize this, uh, have a recorded session on uh, looking at uh, curriculum, uh, 
uh, and looking at um, education reforms because for the last 50 years from the time that uh, Professor Dudley C.S. came to Sri Lanka in 1970 or 71, they've been talking about this uh, mismatch between education system and the job market. Uh, so uh, somewhere down the line, I think uh, I tend to believe that COVID-19 will give us that that us to kind of force us to look at education reforms. Uh, any last points? Because uh, I think we have uh, come to the end of our program today. Uh, today's uh, uh, session, we'll have a uh, few more sessions. But uh, I would like to invite all three of all to give a kind of um, maybe something that you would like to tell uh, uh, educators, uh, tell uh, trainers uh, some, pos some kind of positive uh, point or some uh, practical thing uh, in, from your point of view, from your experience, that they should kind of employ. Mariam, would you like to go first? Oh, me, awesome. Yeah. I, I think my advice to educators is your classroom is your playground. So you design your content according to the way you think you want your students to learn. So I do know that sometimes you are, you are yeah, tying you know students, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the players, exactly. all that, yeah. So in terms of the deliverables, but you can make your classroom better. You can make it fun, you can make it engaging, and you can make your people communicate with each other. And it doesn't matter whether you're teaching grade fives, grade 12s or a 60 year old person or somebody in corporate, it's the same thing. Once you get into that platform, that's your background and design your content to be a best reflection of yourself and the learning that you require from your educators, from your students. Yes, yeah. Amma, on this point of uh, mismatch, uh, you know, this, this has to be, uh, you know, discussed carefully. The thing is now, yes, there has been this complaint about uh, mismatch between uh, the industry needs and what the universities uh, produce. Uh, but then, you know, uh, there is a realization that, of course, the curriculum uh, design should be uh, in consultation with the industry. It's true. But what is this industry that we are talking about? I mean, it's not just the, the commercial entities, you know, that uh, that, uh, that can be classified as industry. I mean, it's the whole society. I mean, there is non-profit sector, there is also public sector, the larger society. So educational outcomes should be broad, actually. Of course, there are certain professional uh, fields that definitely will need direct, you know, industrial uh, experience, like it could be medicine or engineering or even law for that matter. But largely, you know, general education is uh, is uh, uh, cater, catered to a sort of a broader goals of education, not just necessarily targeting a particular skill, because the surveys indicate that 70% of the jobs available in the market uh, can be filled by anybody, you know. So those are general uh, core skills are needed, life skills are needed for that. So it's not about just having a particular computer skill or engineering skill. So we have to be very careful about this mismatch. Mismatch. Who is talking about this mismatch? Can that be actually bridged? You know, in terms of what we currently think. So it has to be looked at broadly. It's true that the curriculum has to be relevant, but relevant to whom? It is for all stakeholders. So therefore. It's not a narrow, narrowly, it, it's actually a narrowly discussed issue. We have to broaden it actually, I in order to make it is more relevant uh, in today's context. Right. Um, so, um, uh, maybe I want to give a message to practically all the stakeholders. So, I'll start with the teachers. Um, and my humble request to all teachers is that uh, teaching is probably the most noble uh, profession. Uh, if you can impart knowledge, you can impact positively the lives of people. Do not just do it for the sake of doing a job or so forth. Look at creating positive people. Don't be happy about just creating 50 students with nine A's. Look at the people who are failing and give them a helping hand. Teach them to survive in this gruesome world. I think that's a, a, a true testament of what a teacher is, and that's where the respect comes in. Mm. And it's not only about books, it's about overall life. In terms of parents, be much more open-minded. End of the day, uh, your son or daughter needs to be the best version of themselves. 
yes, you need to push them. Uh, however, be also open-minded of what the world wants, what is in demand. Do not be fixated of producing a doctor in the family or a string of doctors in the family or a string of lawyers in the family. Uh, sometimes I know for a fact lawyers are struggling to find work these days, even in, in Sri Lanka. So be more open-minded and ensure that you allow your children to follow their passion because it's a lifetime uh, uh, investment that you're looking at. And if your true love for your children comes about of making them happy. In terms of policy makers, you need to keep in mind you are not perpetual. Uh, your days are also going to be numbered uh, irrespective of which spectrum that you are in. So as long as you are holding office, ensure that you bring in these reforms, even though it might be tough. Of course, it doesn't mean that you need to bring in reforms for the sake of it, but look at it from the future perspective. And for corporates, uh, my message is invest in your people, uh, give them the ability to continuously develop themselves. Do not just look at functional level trainings, look at the opportunity of making them better humans, better, better people. And if we look at that from a more positive frame of mind and get all the players into the mixture, I'm sure Sri Lanka can be a hub for um, education. And we got an opportunity now in technology also to make it a hub. If we miss this opportunity now, sadly some other country within the region might be a hot spot for that. And thank you very much once again, Amar, for the invitation. Thank you very, very much. Uh, to all of you. Thank you very much, Mariam. Thank you very much, uh, Nirmal. Thank you very much, uh, ne uh, Moraes, Dr. Moraes, for joining with us. I think uh, this has been very, very inspiring and thought-provoking, and I think we have so much food for thought. Uh, but I do hope that people are li who listen to this program uh, would take something out of it and actually put it to practice and, you know, learn something and that we'll see a change in our society. We'll see a change in our corporate world, in our uh, whole of society. So um, just don't go away yet. Uh, uh, but this is, uh, this is just going to be the, our first discussion. Uh, I do hope you will join us. Uh, Arim, I know it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes with the time uh, differences. And uh, Dr. Morales, we are just starting our semester again and there are lectures and you know, university starting uh, i know nirmal you have so much of commitments so i'm going to ask you to engage with us once again maybe a uh, few days time sure. we'll plan out our next discussion so uh, all the best uh, i would advise you not to move around uh, yet uh, i mean Oh, already free, free from Corona problem. <laughs> yes, sir. and be, uh, be safe and, and a good day to you. And we'll keep in touch. Uh, thank you very much and good day to you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.